Welcome to Brand Ventures, the podcast that's going to take you into the world of adventurous brands. I'm your host, Gustavo, and I'm going to take you guys on a journey with me to discover new brands that are making a difference in today's market. Join me as we dive into the minds of fearless entrepreneurs behind the brand. Discover the secret to their success and how they turn their passion into a profitable business. So sit back, relax, and get ready for an exciting adventure into the world of brand innovation on the Brand Ventures Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the Brand Ventures, the show that's going to take you into the world of adventurous brands. My name is Gustavo, and today we have Jared Sanders. Uh, He's a visual artist, entrepreneur, with a passion for visual arts. Jared works as a VFX supervisor on some of the biggest franchises in Hollywood, including Marvel, Harry Potter, and Stranger Things. He also collaborated with top brands like Apple, Lexus, Amazon, and renowned musical artists like Katy Perry and U2. Jared now operates Hyperlight Media, a visually focused storytelling brand that provides photography and media production services to small businesses, brands, and musical artists. So welcome to the show, Jared. What's going on, man? How's it going? Excellent. All good. I love your shirt. Thank you. Fits uh, fitting with the uh, some of the themes, but yeah, man, super stoked to be here. Um, really excited to, to chat it up with you. I know. I know. I am excited too. Um, okay. I got a few questions, so let's, let's get this started. Um, how... Did your background in the television industry influence the decision to start Hyperlight Media? So it was pretty organic. Um, I had been I went to school for visual effects um, in uh, Florida at Full Sail University. Uh, as soon as I graduated there, jumped out to California, got a couple of jobs, and started just building my um, skill set, my reputation, um, and you know, obviously you're, you're in LA and you understand sort of the studio system. You kind of hop from studio to studio as an artist. So you pick up all kinds of skills as you're going along. So as I was going through and coming up the ranks of being a a visual effects supervisor, photography naturally sort of lends its hand to that because as a supervisor, you're responsible to bring back whatever you see on set back to the studio so that the artist can recreate things um, so that we have reference and a whole other bunch of reasons. Um, so photography sort of just fell into my lap that way. Um, but through that and being on set um, in, in some of the biggest projects, I started picking up a liking for uh, for filming and, and photography. Um, so when I decided to leave visual effects and start my own agency in LA, um, we focused on doing creative. And one of the things was my business partner, who's uh, kind of like a marketing genius, he ran all of the business side, the marketing side, the sales side of our business. And I was in charge of creative. And when you're starting your own business, as, as you know, sometimes you got to get your hands dirty and you're the only person that can sort of do the job until you have enough money to, to pay people. So I was the main creative. So anything we shot for our clients, whether it was a still image or a video, I was in charge of doing. So um, I just had to kind of roll my sleeves up, learn the skills in a formal capacity so that I was able to produce um, as, as the best I could at the time, um, for, for our clients. So I started Hyperlight sort of as just like an Instagram handle, just to put out my favorite photos and and my favorite videos that I would work on for personal projects. And that sort of just grew into brands getting in contact with me, companies getting in contact with me, um, art, musical artists, things like that, who these were people getting in contact with me, asking me to produce in my style, um, visuals for them. So it, it yeah. sort of was like a really organic flow. Yeah. How do you think working on these big projects like uh, Marvel movies, Harry Potter and Stranger Things uh, help you shape your photography? So I think, number one, like you said, when you're on set, there's an amazing energy and you meet all kinds of people. Everybody there has a purpose. Everybody has their own skill set. So you're really sort of seeing the entire um, pipeline, if you will, of how they're creating the sausage, right? From the beginning (laughs) till the end. I think just being on both sides of the pipeline helped me form my process, helped me form my, my vision. Um, and it, it actually lends me to when I'm doing production, like I'm able to, like I said, take some of those tips and tricks that I learned, provide them for clients that I work with now, but obviously at a fraction of the price, I'm not working with Hollywood yeah. budgets, but I can bring some of that, that Hollywood flair to, to the uh, projects I work on. Which project was your favorite? So I think yeah. if I had to pick one that was my favorite, 
Um, I worked on a really cool Apple commercial. Um, and it was like, it's like one of those insane Hollywood stories. Like we flew out from LA to France to shoot this Apple commercial on a green screen stage, which could have been shot in LA, but because of the parameters and Apple, Apple secret sauce, we had to like actually go yeah. to this crazy, uh, this crazy production area inside of France. So that was probably one of my favorite things. And just working with like the creative minds behind that, um, from the Apple team to the production team in France to our team that was doing the visual effects. I think that was like probably one of the most memorable experiences I've had. Sometimes I compare uh, filmmaking like being in the military, right? So yep. you you have your crew, everybody has a role, the game day is on, everybody knows what they have to do. They have your teams, they're separated, everybody has their earpiece. It's like It's like being in the SWAT team. <laughs> sure. So that, that energy is a mix of um, it's not completely f fun per se. It's very serious. But at the right. same time, you feel like you're a part of like a bigger system and you're creating you're creating magic. Um, when you're on set, you don't get to see uh, what the final product is going to be, obviously, because it has to go through a big, big process. Tell me a little bit about what made you want to transition to find finding your clients and building your own agency? I think um, after after a while, there's one thing that's pretty true about being in the in the industry um, of just film and TV. And um, it's an unfortunate part, but you know, it's it's definitely not for the faint at heart. It's a tough industry, like you mentioned, you know, there's sometimes where you're on set and it's very serious and things are are very high tension and there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of money riding on the line and that's usually what's pushing the most yeah. of the, of the tension. Right. And then there's a lot of artists on set and that means a lot of egos, you know, cause we all, as an artist, we all think our stuff is the best. Um, so it's definitely interesting to see that wrangled and, and managed. Um, and I think as you go through whatever side of the industry you're on, whether you're on post-production or, or production or pre-production, um, I think after time, it just gets, you know, it gets very, um, it gets very tough to stay in po and to stay positive all the time. So yeah. I think, you know, you'll see a lot of artists take breaks, right? They'll take a hiatus or, you know, like a month off here or six months off or whatever um, in between projects. And I, it's just the nature of the beast. So I think for myself, May, one of the main reasons I sort of stepped out was at the time my daughter was being born um, and my career was going really well. And although I am very career oriented, I'm also very family oriented. So I'm always juggling both of those. Um, and this is where sort of maybe the entrepreneurial stuff comes in play. Um, I wanted to, I've always wanted to start my own business. My family had, my dad started, uh, my mom and dad started their own business. They run, they, they ran that for forever. Um, so I saw, I sort of saw that growing up and I, I always had that spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit in me, I've always had a side hustle in whatever job I've been in, whether like at one point I was DJing and at one point I was just doing visual oh, yeah, effects or graphic, graphic design, things like that. So, no, um, no. and I'm going to tell you, uh, Jared's good at everything. He's good nah, at DJing, I don't know about that. graphic VFX. You know, he's one of those guys that's just good at everything. Uh, and I admire you for that. And, I appreciate um, that, man. That means a lot. I love it. I love it. Um, so let's talk about something very interesting, the burnout factor, you know, yeah. um, how fast can you go fast or, <laughs> but it, it is truly about the long game. Right. How, do, how do you translate that on your business now? For me again, like I'm very family oriented. So when I find things that sort of push into that and make me feel uncomfortable in a place on the family side, that's usually when it's time for me to either make a change or take a break or, or address the situation. However. Um, so for me, like go, going back to it, like visual effects, like was starting to push that button where career was going great and I was making more money, but making more money just means demanding more time in that world. Unfortunately, like the more money you make, the more time it just takes from you. And I just didn't feel comfortable giving more time to it, but I still wanted to do the things that I loved doing or the things I loved being around, which were, you know, creating and that's either video or you know whatever visual storytelling medium it was i knew i wanted to keep creating at the stage i'm at now i'm able to pick and choose the clients i want 
Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're doing this you're, with your, uh, your business, you're picking an industry and, and, a, and a special niche, uh, niche area that you really want to be a part of. So I think that you do, sort of figuring out those are really helpful so that you're not just taking on client after client, job after job to the point where you just burn yourself out. There was a realization that happened to me where I was like, okay, I feel I've been working as an editor. I've did, I've done a lot of shooting, directing, producing, and I kind of like hopped from one to the other, like you looking for my, for my place. Uh, I found a good place in post-production. So, uh, because it's, it, it's, it really is the final product, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how important is it for a business, especially a medium or a size uh, company to have like a visually appealing content and how do you think it can impact their success? So number one, every brand business needs some sort of visual identity now. It used to be you could get away with just like the phone number in the yellow pages type deal. And for anybody that's really young, you know, you probably won't get that reference, but um, or even back in the day, it might be okay just to be a Google listing without even any images. But now, even just normal Google search or any social media platform, um, if anybody searches your name and you don't have that visual pres presence, they're not going to find you. That's just the basics of it. And if you can't get found, how are you going to get customers? If you can't get customers, how are you going to have a business? So it's yeah. super important to have some sort of visual identity. Now there's obviously levels of that, right? There's very yeah. minimal and then there's, you know, very high end and expensive sort of wherever your business is at will kind of help dictate and determine whether or not what part of the scale you might fit on in that, or what part of the bell curve you might fit in. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's so important. Um, you know, just from the social media aspect of it, if you start a Facebook page, you can't even open up a business page without it asking you to add images. It won't even let you finish the page. Same thing with Google. You can't open Google business without having some sort of picture. So it's just yeah. really important that you should always be thinking about, and that should always be on top of mind, you know, and, and that goes for people who are just like just a single artist who are trying to sell, you know, paintings, you need to have some sort of visual identity so that it lives online. Yeah, and I think if you're offering, let's say, a premium uh, project, a premium service, uh, a lot of it is uh, perceived value, right? Uh, sure. What what you're getting, uh, feeling, uh, mm -hmm. how they craft their website, what they're talking about, they're telling you about their their passion, or um, all these things can come together really well in a in a visual landscape and. You don't have to sell anything, honestly. Right. You just have to put it together and say, this is what we're all about. Uh, it shows you that they care about the service. It They care about the product. Yep. What advice would you give businesses that are looking for to enhance their visual presence but may have a limited resource on budget? Yeah, so this is a question that I get all the time. Um, first off, you know, look in your your local area to find media companies that might be able to help you, even if it's just a really small shop. Um, there's a ton of people that sort of um, work at the same capacities that I try to work at for my clients, um, where it's like, you know, Hollywood on a budget is what I like to call it, right? You're trying to give the, the most bang for the buck um, and search out those companies and, and see if you can, you know, strike a partnership or a deal. And especially if you're working on a budget, maybe there's something in, you know, the, the trade-off game, maybe your service can help that per that studio or that creative with something. Maybe you can, you know, maybe it's a physical trade-off. Maybe you do, you know, pizza, your pizza shop, right? Maybe you'll yeah. host a pizza party. So there's all kinds of ways that I think yeah. you can work um, the budget restrictions. It's all about partnership at that point and striking a good partnership is the most important part. Yeah. Um, rather than just going to somebody and being a consumer for their service. It's, it's a relationship that, that you, you need to exactly. Yep. because they, they're helping amplify your, your voice and you need to, yep. uh, it's very important. If you're not like, let's say the budget is the biggest thing, right? And let's say you don't have a, mm -hmm. a marketing budget to put, you know, towards that. Well, everybody these days has some sort of iPhone, Android phone, camera phone, whatever version of that you have, because everybody has one. 
Um, and if you don't personally have one, you probably know somebody that does. Um, yeah. Anybody can get started. And like you were saying, showing people the passion that you have about your service or your product or um, the thing you're providing is the most important part. Like every, you think, and you've heard the story a million times about your own company. You've thought about the own, your own story a million times about your product, but nobody else knows that. No matter how many times you say it, not everybody knows the intricacies. Not everybody right. knows the passion that you have or the love that you have for that specific um, su like subject or product. Yeah. So just figuring out a way to put that on camera, um, whether that's just using an iPhone or, or buying your own camera and doing it, there's ways that you can do that and you don't have to go breaking the bank yeah. to, uh, to, to, to achieve that. So I was talking to, um, to a client yesterday and uh, we were having a discussion about whether to make videos or one video or many for social. And, mm -hmm. and he was very apprehensive. He, he sells premium, like high, ultra high quality customers very high priced um, packages. And he's telling me that he doesn't need uh, fancy production or he need, doesn't need a video. And I'm thinking, uh, oh, because he says the ROI does not, is not going to reflect. So how, videos are not closing deals. They're not uh, bringing in revenue and they can't measure the ROI of a video and I'm telling them you, you cannot uh, measure the dopamine or, or the reaction that someone is going to get from watching your videos. They're right. definitely going to know that you don't care <laughs> in a very um, so, uh, unconscious way because you posted two or three pictures. They don't look that great. And you're offering your uh, high premium packages but your social media is not saying that. Right. Yes, it's very hard to measure the impact of a, a well-crafted video when you bring in volumes of people to your site and you can give them a unified message and your message is well-crafted, is well-intentioned and well-produced, people are going to respond to that. So... You know, with, with the rapid advances of technology and uh, visual effects, how do you stay up to date How how with these trends and the techniques in the industry? Um, visual effects in, in general, like there's, there's like a couple different methods um, or routes, I should say. If it's a movie, it's a very traditional route. And obviously they're building cutting edge technology for the next Transformers movie, right? Because they have, they're, you know, doing new things or we'll take even the Mandalorian, for example, right? They built cutting edge technology to film the Mandalorian so that it looked like everything was on location when in reality it was a stage with a bunch of screens, right? Or, or what they call the volume. Yeah. So at the scale that we're working at, <laughs> we're obviously not going to be doing those kind of things. Um, so I think expectations are a big thing to set with your clients to make them realize that that may not even be on the table. Um, but as far as like, there are still ways to sort of cheat those techniques and, um, you know, get in front or at least try different techniques as a small business. And you're, if you're looking to be sort of like the cutting edge of media, or you want to look like you're on the cutting edge of media, you know, just paying attention online, paying attention to the TikToks and Instagram reels and YouTube shorts and, um, you know, spending time where these things are progressively being um shown in or redone every day like youtube is updated every day with new videos right hundreds of yeah. new videos flooding the marketplace so there's ways to to find inspiration or find techniques and challenges and things that you can overcome through these channels um and just keeping relevant um so for myself i'm always looking at these so that i can always keep my ideas fresh um you know there's yeah. always some 10 year old kid who's filming something that's amazing. And I, I'm trying to figure out how to re-engineer it. Right. Because they just did something that they thought was cool and it turned out to be amazing. So there's always going to be some of that, but I think it's just paying attention in the right areas will help you. Um, the problem is like, you can get inspiration overload, right. Or reference yeah. overload. And you're literally just like, uh, what's it, what is it called when you're, you're paralyzed by over like yeah. analysis by 
wait, paralysis by analysis, right? Yeah. That's what they call it, where you just overanalyze, you think, 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 and you never do. So yeah. I think, you know, making sure that you're still executing yeah. yourself as, you know, as a, as a creative, I think is really important. You, you take some of those ideas and you're like, these are all really cool ideas. Maybe I'll try one of them, right? Um, at a time, but I think it relates to, to technology. Uh, there's so much available right now. AI, right. Uh, the, the cheapening of, of, of technology, everything's getting smaller and faster. Yeah. And, it's all commoditized. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you, and people get lost in the technology. It's happened to me. Yep. I can admit to it. You, you want to buy the, the newest camera because it opens up, uh, a, a a little bit wider than the other one and uh it, it just it's better in the dark or and and people lose focus on the importance of the tool versus yep. uh the message versus crafting a good story um and people can do things on the iphone that they couldn't you know do five years ago uh you can shoot a whole movie on it and, and edit it on your app and you can use AI uh, or you can pretend to use AI uh, to create a masterpiece. Um, <laughs> what do you think of AI? Really AI, there's no artificial intelligence as in like, there's nothing, there's no robot actually doing this. It's, it's more these, these tools that have been built are literally the best researcher in the world, right? They're just scouring yeah. the internet in seconds, something that nobody on the planet could do. So that's sort of the artificial sound, but they're not making anything up. They're just scouring the internet and then using those references in the same way that you would or I would if we were going to reference, uh, you know, for a new video, we're going to go look for a bunch of reference, take from what we want and then build our new, our new video. Yeah. So that's sort of like, to me, that's the way it sort of breaks down. And, and maybe there obviously is some even crazier technology that none of us know about right now. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I won't get, <laughs> I can't get into that because I don't know about it. Yeah. Um, but as far as AI, I think I think this scare of like it's going to take my job is a little ridiculous yeah, because yeah. if you use it properly and you're if you use the tool in your position, it's only going to make you better. Yeah. We'll take Chat GPT. That's the most that's the hot button uh, yeah. word right now, right? Chat GPT. So that thing, a lot of people are worried about. It's gonna it's gonna write. It's gonna take a writer's job or it's gonna do this. Well, it just took a writer who's a like you have a talent that not a lot of people have. If you're a good writer. And it's going to make you that much better of yeah. a writer because it can help you reference and help you think about things or rephrase things in ways that you didn't think of. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's like taking your mind and opening up and expanding. It's almost like if everybody had the limitless pill, right. <laughs> for yeah. writing. Um, and then same thing with the art. Like it's, it does create some photorealistic art and some of it's cool and some of it's controversial, like the Pope wearing yeah. the puffy jacket, <laughs> but in reality, like it's just doing things that like you, that somebody's thinking of, somebody's still thinking of that, that art and plugging in the words to tell the machine to do it. So it's not yeah. like taking that job. It's not thinking of it on its it own. It could be a talented prompter, you know? It, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. It's it, just, it, it, to me, it's the most talented research artist in the world. That's the way I think of it. That's a good opinion. I like that. What excites you about the future of visual storytelling? You know, I've seen your photographs uh, and you're, you love space. You love technology. Uh, where Where is it going to go for you? One of my favorite things being here and being very fortunate to be on the Space Coast, I'm able to see rocket launches um, up close. I was able to get press access recently. So now I can go on site and see certain launches um, like Artemis 1. I was able to be there for that, which was amazing. So from an, like a personal experience standpoint, that's yeah. sort of what I what sort of drives the engine for Hyperlight. Um, I want to make sure, again, going back to like family time, I want to make sure the projects I'm working on are one, creatively motivating me. They're, I'm not just taking it to make a check. Um, I really want to be creatively motivated or I want to have a connection with the person that I'm working with. It may be boring material from a, a creative standpoint, but if I really connect with the business owner, I want to, I want to help them. That's my, one of my main drivers is always helping. I want to see if I can up their game and up their, their business and, and make sure that they're successful. Um, and then I like sort of like where you are, man, traveling, I want to travel more and I want Hyperlight media to sort of be that vehicle to get me to travel more. Um, 
than I have in the past. Um, so I use Hyperlight Media as a, sort of almost like an excuse or a way to, sh- to to fuel the vehicle to get me to do things like, let me go shoot some rockets because it's really cool. And that's a very personal thing to me, but it's also, you know, it's cool. And I, I'm one of the few people in the world that get a chance to do it. Or yeah. maybe I get to go shoot a music video on Joshua Tree like I did last year, which was like sort of a bucket list thing. I'd been to Joshua Tree, I don't know how many times when I lived in California, but yeah. never was I there to like film something. So that was really like a bucket list type deal. So those are the things that really drive the business for Hyperlight. Um, It's really sort of like what creatively fulfills me and makes me happy. What can I, can I take my family on a trip, you know, through it? And also, am I helping the the business owner or the person I'm creating with? Um, Because I always think of it as a partnership. I never think of it as you're hiring me, you're my boss. I think of it as we're a creative partnership and you're a creative, whether you think so or not, maybe you only work in, Google spreadsheets and that's all you do all day. Yeah. But I'm sure you have creative ideas and I want to I want to help you bring those to life. I love it. I love it. It's amazing where you can uh where you can go with a camera. Uh where they let you 100%. In yeah. and uh, you can pretty much do a lot of things that you wouldn't do without a camera. Um it opens the door to a lot of things and uh, I want to get a, a, a make a t-shirt that says uh that we invented a time machine and I wanted, I want a picture of a camera and it says, this is our time machine. <laughs> it is a Dude, time machine. It's, it's a, hundred, a way man, to I, capture the, a moment in time, you know, and never before seen quality. Mm-hmm. And, and you're going to go 30 years down the line and you're going to see that video and it's going to bring your ride back. It's going to be yep. better than your mo- memory. It's going to, yep. it's, it's way better. Um, yeah, I have a saying, I, I had this on my Instagram handle for the longest time and I just recently changed it, but my saying was cameras are the closest things we have to time machines. And if anybody knows me and I don't know if, I don't know if anybody that's watching or listening, um, has interacted with me, but back to the future is my favorite movie of all time. So, um, being able to sort of correlate that and, and hear somebody else say it and sort of, um, you know, reinforce my thought, like, yes, you're right. We can't go forward in time, right? That, that still hasn't been invented, but we can take these snapshots of our life and document them. And, you know, like the fact that when my kid grows up, I have almost a minute by minute documentary of them in my phone um, to show them and hand that off to them before, you know, I pass away is amazing. Cause I have, you know, my parents gave me a photo album, but it's like, you know, 50 pictures maybe. And then it stops. Um, so yeah, you're right, man. It, it's the closest thing we have to time machines. I think it helps unload memories, uh, unload them into a space that's outside our memory. Uh, our memory kind of plays us tricks, right? So it, it, sure. it, it adapts memories and creates new ones based on those old memories. And they start fading away on what you end up is having an idea of a memory that you had, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then watching a video is like bringing that to to the original place where uh, on your memory. So it, it, memory feels like elastic in a way. You know, the, mm-hmm. the longer it goes, the more it stretches, the more you forget about the source. Um, and I think a video a response to that. And you can use that in your business. You can use that in your family life. Uh, you can use it to connect emotionally with yourself, with others. Um, and I think, you know, it's a great, it's a great time we're living in. So yeah. I, I just want you to give us uh, your, your handles. Where, where can we find you? Where can we look at these rocket uh, ship photos that are so amazing? I highly, highly, highly recommend you go check Jared's work. Yeah. So you can find me on all social platforms at Hyperlite. It's H-Y-P-R-L-Y-T-E. Um, it's a little, one of those weird drop the vowel plays, but um, you can find me on on uh, Instagram mainly. That's usually where I hang out the most. That's where I'll respond to DMs the most, but I'm on all social platforms. Um, so if you're a Facebooker or if you're a Twitter person, you'll find me on there. But uh, you can also check out my website, which is where everything sort of falls together including the print shop um at hyperlight.com awesome well jared thank you so much for coming to the brand ventures uh this has been a lot of fun and i'll see you guys next time 
Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. This was awesome.